notion of coherence uh, groups over very long distances. Uh, and so this is a prediction from the model that cell heterogeneity uh, in terms of kind of ability to sense and respond to this chemical gradient was required for successful migration. And then that sort of led to Paul and his team going into the experimental system, isolating cells right at the front of this invading stream and cells further behind, sequencing them um, to look at their gene expression and learning that essentially indeed there were differences in the leading cells in terms of having upregulated guidance factor receptors, expressing MMP, so breaking down the extracellular matrix, and also expressing different coherence to the trailing cells. So this was a real example in which qualitative comparison with models and experiment led to the uh, essentially the discovery of new biology. And another example is uh, an example, again, about collective migration, but this time is an example of coherent collective migration of a population of cells through an intact epithelium. So epithelia usually make barriers, they like to kind of be coherent and intact. And so the question became one of how does a population uh, of cells migrate as, an, uh, as a coherent group through an intact epithelium? The biological context was early mouse embryo development, where a population of cells needs to get from right down here. So if this is the very early mouse, right down here at the bottom tip of the, uh, of the developing embryo up until around this waist, so somewhere about here, in order to specify correctly the head tail axis. So the observations of Shankar Srinivas and his group in Oxford were that there's particular configurations of cells in these epithelial tissues, which we call rosettes. So basically just when five or more cells meet a common vertex. Um, and they wanted to understand whether there was a role for rosettes in this migratory process and what happens if, you know, or whether we could understand what might happen if they weren't allowed to form. So we simulated uh, or set, set up a different kind of model this time, known as the vertex model, still representing cells as individual entities. And what we did was we simulated essentially the migration of a, a bunch of cells, this population right down from at the distal tip, up until around the waist of the embryo, and observed what happens in simulations where rosettes were both allowed to form and where they weren't. And the kind of sort of take home message, and it was quite striking really, was that if we allow these rosette structures to form in the simulations, then the population could migrate as a coherent group altogether. And as soon as we turned off that ability for rosettes to form in the, the simulations, then the, the group tended to fragment and break apart. And so the idea was that somehow this sort of ability to form rosettes in the system enables it to buffer against this sort of the perturbation or the disequilibrium, if you like, caused by this kind of population trying to migrate together. And then again, this prompted Shankar and his team to go back into the mouse and they looked at a mouse mutant in which essentially uh, rosette structures can't form. And lo and behold, what you see is that these, uh, this group of cells can't migrate together as a coherent entity. So another example really of where, so this qualitative comparison between models and data allowed us to say something, make a prediction that was then tested and verified experimentally. So that was sort of work that we've done in the past and some of it quite a while ago. And what I think has really changed though over the past few years, especially in developmental biology, as it's really, I think, transformed from being a qualitative discipline where we, you know, our observations are qualitative and our comparisons between models and data is qualitative. It's now very much becoming a quantitative discipline. We've got ever increasing amounts of data that's quantitative with ever kind of better, well, or more well resolved spatial and temporal detail. And so I think at that point, the kind of methods for data and analysis and formal kind of methods for model testing and calibration become ever more important. So an increasing sort of part of our work is to kind of engage in that sphere and in that world and think about how to really calibrate models to data to draw biological uh, conclusions. So the kind of uh, the, the sort of way in which we sort of sell ourselves now is that what we want to do in our group is to combine mechanistic sort of more traditional, if you like, mathematical modeling ideas with statistical and machine learning tools to provide new insights. So it's bringing in the, these are concepts and ideas from statistics and machine learning that I think is, is novel and enabling us in some cases to make progress. Okay, 
having said all that, in, I think in, in mathematical biology, it's hugely complicated. And those examples I showed you are incredibly complicated. And I think it's important to kind of make progress in a setting where you can kind of learn to walk uh, uh, before you try to run, if you like. Um, so we turned, instead of kind of looking in the embryo itself to some in vitro experiments to learn how to connect models with data. So again, this is work that we did sort of quite a while ago. So the types of in vitro cell biology assays we're interested in often looking at are, for example, ones known as a barrier assay, where you um, grow essentially a population of cells to confluence within a really a cookie cutter. And then at some point you remove that cookie cutter. And what you do is you watch as the population uh, migrates and proliferates outwards. And so this is maybe something that people might think about as using to, to think about tumor growth in a very loose sense. We also think a lot about scratch assays. So here you grow a population of cells to confluence in a disc and you mechanically essentially scrape away a proportion of the, the, the cell population. And then you watch as the population invades from both the top and the bottom, proliferates um, and, and essentially fills sort of over a time period of, I don't know, up to 24 hours the available space. And then the last one is arguably the most simple, which is just to grow the confluence assay. So you, what you do is you try and seed cells at low density, approximately uniformly at random over the dish, and then you just watch as they move around and they proliferate and they grow to confluence. And so all of these assays, I think, provide really ideal starting points for thinking about how to connect uh, models with data. So the first part of the talk is going to be kind of learning about how to do that, and the second part is going to be this application. So uh, again, we used a very simple to start with individual based model where we took a lattice to make life easy. Uh, our lattice has spacing delta and our model is volume excluding and agent based. So we're going to initially uniformly at random populate the lattice where each site on the lattice is populated with some given probability and I can have at most one cell in each site on the lattice. And then each cell <laughs> can do one of two things. It can move on the lattice and it attempts to move at rate PM. Um, and when it attempts to move, it chooses one of its one, two, three, four nearest neighbor lattice sites uniformly at random. If that lattice site is empty, then it moves into it. And if not, it aborts the movement event. And exactly the same rules hold for proliferation. Uh, the cell picks a target site uniformly at random from its four nearest neighbors. And if that site is free, then it, um, it drops a daughter agent or cell into that site. And if not, it aborts the attempt to proliferate. So you can do lots of this. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to write an incredibly piece, simple piece of code that will just simulate the evolution of the system over time. So here's a three snapshots, uh, Increase time increasing from left to right of uh, such a system where the movement rate is relatively high uh, relative to the proliferation rate. And you can also simulate in other parameter regimes. So the one at the bottom now being a system where the proliferation rate is much higher relative to the movement rate. And what you can see is the onset of these kind of very clear spatial structure. Okay, so that's very, very, very simple model, simple dynamics. But what we wanted to do was to apply this kind of model to some of these in vitro um, experiments. And so for the first thing that we're going to do is just look at the growth to confluence experiments because they're super simple. Uh, initial conditions are just populating uh, the, the site with the, the lattice uniformly at random. And first of all, to again, learn to walk before we can run, we're just going to use in silico data from the discrete model and investigate the extent to which we can recover the parameters um, of the model that we use to generate the in silico data. So we're going to work in a Bayesian framework because we like to think about quantifying uncertainty in estimates. So we're after essentially uh, evaluating the posterior distribution. So the probability of model parameters PM and PP given some data D. And we write that using Bayes rule as being proportional to the product of the likelihood of the data given the parameters and the prior distribution. So here the prior distribution just encodes any previous information or knowledge we might have about parameters. And we tend to try and be kind of as unrestrictive as possible. So clearly these parameters are bounded below by zero. Um, but we try to not be, uh, you know, we, we usually use a uniform prior over some fairly wide range. Um, and we're going to use approximate Bayesian computation to estimate this posterior distribution because the likelihood of this model is intractable. 
what does that mean? Uh, in its simplest form, a very large number of times, I'm going to sample parameter, a parameter or a parameter vector from the prior distribution. I'm going to simulate the model using that parameter set. And then I want to evaluate how close the model output is to the data. Uh, and I'm going to need to use a summary statistic of the data and some distance function. And then essentially I assign a weight to that parameter set and that'll depend on this distance. So typically what you might do is give that weight one, so accept those parameter values into the posterior if essentially the model output and the data are sufficiently close and you'd assign a weight zero if they were far apart. And uh, your choice of kind of the threshold for assigning weight one or zero is, is sort of user defined. Okay, so we're going to use this approximate Bayesian computation approach to estimate the posterior. What's the problem? Well, the first problem is the data we get out are really high dimensional. So we're going to simulate these assays over a period of maybe 24 hours. And we've got the position of every cell in the assay uh, at every time point over that 24 hour period. So really kind of comparing the model output and data in, in, that, in that context is, is essentially just prohibitive from a computational perspective. So you need to ask some questions about what summary statistics you can use to compare model output and data, and how do they differ in terms of how informative they are about the parameters in the model. So to give you some examples, we could just compare the cell number in our simulation and our data set at 12 hours um, and use that as a summary statistic. So what I'm showing you here is the posterior distribution that you get from doing that. So the, um, the dashed lines, <laughs> excuse me, are the true parameter values that we use to generate the in silico data. And then the little white dots are the top 1% of parameter sets when they're ranked in terms of that, that distance. So ranked in terms of the closeness of their cell number in the simulation to the data. And then in shading, we've just got a smooth posterior that's uh, estimated using some bivariate kernel density estimator. And the take home message is not surprisingly, that if all you do is look at the cell number output in your simulation um, to kind of try and estimate the model parameters, you can get a relatively precise uh, estimate of the proliferation rate in the system, but you learn essentially nothing about the movement rate. So the cell number is great for estimating PP and useless for estimating PM, the motility parameter. On the other hand, if you for example, randomly pick five cells in your experiment and you track them over 12 hours, and you use the kind of data from that, those cell tracks to generate or to define the summary statistic, then you get huge amounts of information about the motility rate, so the motility parameter in your system. And as you might expect, you learn almost nothing, essentially nothing about the rate at which cells are proliferating. So it's clear that different summary statistics can tell you very different amounts about different parameters in the system. So the question we asked in this paper was kind of like, what's the optimal co combination of summary statistics in terms of providing, if you like, the most information about the, the, the parameters? And it turns out that for this particular experimental setup, just this growth to confluence assay, if you don't include trajectory data in your summary statistics, then uh, you can do a good job in estimating the proliferation rate, but you'll basically never get a good handle on the movement rate in the model. But if you do include trajectory data, then you can essentially combine summary statistics to get very good estimates of both of the parameters in the model. And then what you can do, being confident now that you've sort of tried this in the in silico setting is put it all to good use to uh, infer the motility and proliferation rates for two different cell lines. So this is on the top, we've got a breast cancer cell line. Um, on the bottom, we've got a fibroblast cell line. And I'm not gonna combine the summary statistics for a minute. I'm just gonna to keep the, the summary statistics separate. But what you can see is if you look at the estimates of the parameters you get for the two different cell lines, in effect, they both appear to proliferate at approximately the same rates, but it's the movement rates of these cell lines that are very different. So essentially the fibroblast moving much quicker than the breast cancer cell line. And that gives you then the ability to predict how quickly one relatively relative to the other will go grow to confluence. Okay. So this kind of led us on to thinking about question of experimental design. So it's great, like if we've got uh, the ability to sort of track cells over an experiment, then we can, as well as count them, then we can essentially estimate the both of the parameters in our model. 
but it's a bit of a faff. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a faff tracking styles, right? So in particular, if I could go back up, my computer's a bit slow today. Here we go. If we can go back up to this figure, um, it's fine to track the breast cancer cell line. So this is the top cell line where the cells look quite round. And we had, you know, fairly good success at tracking those cells using kind of existing software packages and automated tracking tools. But for the fibroblast cell line, where, you know, the cell shapes are really kind of very, 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 very widely, and they're quite sort of uh, odd, it was really difficult, if not impossible, to track those cells over uh, the sort of series of images we had using automated techniques. So we actually had to go in and look through every image in the set and track these cells by hand. And you really just don't want to be doing that when you've got huge amounts of data. So we begin to ask the question, you know, of experimental design is that, you know, in this growth to confluence assay, uh, you need to track individual cells, but could we change to an assay with non-uniform initial conditions like the barrier assay, or like the, um, the scratch or the wound healing assay shown here, and would that help? So would we still need to track cells, which is really kind of time consuming and laborious? And the short uh, sort of take home message is if, if you work in the context of a scratch assay where you've got essentially uh, spatial heterogeneity in the initial conditions, then you can get a very tight handle or estimate on both the model parameters without resorting to need to track cells over time. Um, whereas you simply just can't do that in the growth to confluence experiments. So the kind of experimental design, short story, uh, or uh, take home message that experimental design really, really matters when it comes to estimating the parameters of uh, these very, very simple models. Okay, so as a partway summary, um, what I wanted to highlight is that it's possible to use kind of very simple models to interrogate in vitro data. These models were incredibly, you know, like essentially trivial to implement and simulate computationally. Um, and that allowed us to infer the parameters using uh, a very naive implementation of approximate Bayesian computation. The, and then from an experimental design perspective, we see that for growth to confluence assays, which essentially lack enough sort of spatial structure, we need to uh, get hold of cell trajectory data, as well as sort of uh, essentially uh, sort of looking at density or position over time or cell number over time uh, to identify both the model parameters. Whereas in scratch assays, you get sort of sufficient information on things like spatial correlations to identify both model parameters without needing to track the cells individually. Whilst I'm kind of about to change tack, does anyone have any questions? No? Okay. Well, there's a comment on, maybe perhaps we should talk about it at the end because you're talking about single cell tracking, but we've been working on a technique called DDM, uh, diffusion uh, microscopy. And the, uh, Tim is on the, uh, the, the call here and he's been working on that. And that's a way of just looking at your whole information and extracting out movement parameters from that. So it may help you uh, do less work. Okay, that would be really good to, to know about. What, go on, maybe you can chat or I can email I'll you. Say, yeah, I, I, I might have to run away, but if Tim and Katerina, because uh, Katerina is his other uh, supervisor, they hopefully can stay around and have a chat with you. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> always, always welcome um, suggestions for how to deal with the data better. So moving on and fast forwarding like 10 years or so, um, I got talking with a collaborator uh, in engineering, Heba Salem, about a data set that she'd worked with a little bit, which was essentially a genome-wide RNAi screen of endothelial cells. So importantly, I guess the take-home message is that what they'd done at this team was to do a, a huge array essentially of scratch assay experiments where they'd looked at knocking down thousands of different genes um, and repeating the experiment with each knockdown a large number of times. So this was a huge kind of undertaking, huge amounts of data. Um, and their aim in doing this was to identify uh, some novel components of signaling pathways that regulate migration. It sounded exactly like the kind of thing that we were interested in. Only when we looked at it a sort of a bit more, what they were actually doing or what they were doing in these experiments was they were uh, essentially making a scratch uh, in, the, in the assay. So growing the population to confluence scratching, taking an image at what we would call sort of time zero directly after the scratch, 
and then waiting uh, for 24 hours and taking another image. And really, they were just quantifying the extent to which the wound had closed over that 24 hour time period to identify um, sort of genes that were regulating positively or negatively wound healing. Uh, but what that doesn't really tell you is how they're doing that. So what we were very interested in thinking about is whether we could use a mathematical model in, in tandem with this data set to understand essentially the functional impact of knocking down these different genes. And then we wanted to ask if we could kind of go even further than that if, um, by being able to group genes according to the mechanisms that were impacted by uh, the knockdowns. So that was our sort of big question. So it's essentially like taking exactly the setup that we've just been dealing with, <laughs> but multiplying it by uh, many thousand fold when it came to the amount of data that we, we had available and the number of different experimental conditions. Okay, so obviously now we needed to do something different in the context of data analysis. So what Hebra developed um, as part of her fellowship in engineering was uh, essentially a method called the deep scratch. So it's an analysis pipeline, which is based on a unit architecture. She would be able to talk you through the details, uh, not, not me. Um, but the crux of it is that um, it can detect cell centers using uh, a nuclear, if, if, if the, the nucleus is stained, uh, and then it uses the locations of these cell centers to segment the wound edge, and then also approximate cell area uh, in the experiments using a Voronoi tessellation. So this is just showing you three different uh, sort of um, scenarios. So first is a wild type scenario, so no genes are knocked down. You can see the nuclear stain and the membrane stain. And then we've also, I've also shown um, what happens in the context of CDH5 lockdown and a CDC42 lockdown. So the take home message was really that although we have kind of hundreds of replicates for some of these genes, we can do the uh, data analysis in uh, an automated fashion and get out exactly the numbers that we need. So that, that bit was, that really was fantastic. So the next thing was to think about the type of model that we might use. So we were sort of hopeful that, very hopeful, I think, um, <laughs> that essentially we could, although we've only got kind of very sparse uh, data in, in time, so really we've just got an initial condition and, and, a, and a snapshot of 24 hours, that we could kind of tease out a bit more than we could um, sort of previously. So we were not aiming just to infer kind of motility and proliferation parameters, but to think about adhesion or contact guidance and things like that. So we looked around and we decided to use again an individual based model. Um, and it was a stochastic model that was proposed and used by Alex Browning in, in this paper here in the interface. And so the, the model, as I said, stochastic, it's off lattice this time individual based model um, and in Alex's formulation, it accounted for both cell motility and proliferation and the effect that local variation in cell density had on both of those two uh, processes. So we wanted to use this model off the shelf because Alex had already shown that essentially it was an appropriate model to use for uh, scratch assay data. So he used it in the context of kind of calibrating uh, or attempted to calibrate this model to data in the context of having scratch assay data. So how does it work? Effectively, cells are point particles. And to understand kind of how they move around in space, one of the things you do is to define a crowding surface. So if the xn are the position of, oh, there's a bit of a typo here, so it should be an xi, uh, of, all the, of all the cells, then that you can define a crowding surface and then define the bias vector of cell n to be the gradient, essentially, or depend on the gradient of that crowding surface. So if the positive values of this parameter gamma b, then cells want to move or disperse or place their daughter cells down gradients in, in cell density, with the preference or the extent to which they want to do that depending on the steepness. And what you end up doing is you sample movement and proliferation directions for each one of your cells according to a von Mises distribution, where essentially the parameters of that von Mises distribution depend on this, the, the, the details of this crowding surface. So what's going on in here is that if, um, is that on average cells want to move down gradients in the, the, the sort of uh, steepest gradient uh, uh, of decrease in cell density, get words out today, 
Um, but as the kind of the magnitude of this bias vector goes to zero, then the von Mises distribution just relaxes to a uniform distribution. So when the crowding is uniform, the cells just move randomly. And the rates then at which cells attempt to move and proliferate in this model, uh, well, they're governed according to Poisson processes, but there's a sort of basement uh, or basal, if you like, movement rate M for each cell. And then uh, the rate at which cells type, uh, attempt to move is modulated by the local cell density. And so if the parameter gamma M is negative, then cells uh, try to move increasingly often as the cell density increases. And if gamma M is positive, then the cells attempt to move less often as the local density increases. And exactly the same thing for proliferation. There's some base proliferation rate P and the extent to which cells attempt to proliferate is essentially governed according or determined by the local cell density uh, and this parameter gamma P. The other thing we included in our model that Alex Browning didn't was cell death at a constant rate D. Um, and it wasn't really sort of deemed necessary, I think, in Alex's experiments because the cell number always increased. But in some of the knockdowns we have, that cell number certainly decreases. So that was something that was certainly necessary to include. So here's the data. Um, and again, we're going to work in a, or here's a snap, some snapshots of the data. But again, we're going to work in a Bayesian framework where we want the probability. Uh, posterior distribution of model parameters theta given the data D. We write that as proportional to the product of the likelihood in the prior, only this time we've got a slightly larger parameter vector where we've got six parameters to try to estimate. Um, and so in essence for our ABC algorithm, what we're going to try to do is what we're going to do is we're going to initialize our simulations with the using the image that of each kind of well at zero hours, simulate the model forward in time to 24 hours, and then make comparisons between the model and the data at that 24 hour time point. Thanks to the previous work we've done and also the work that Alex did in his paper, uh, we had a fairly good idea this time about the summary statistics that we could use to compare model and data. So we're gonna use cell number at 24 hours, uh, the density profile at 24 hours, and then also the pair correlation function. So this is essentially the density of pairs separated by a given distance R in the experiment. So we knew, we knew what to do there, and that, and that I think made life quite a lot simpler. We didn't have to hunt around for what was sensible to choose. What's the big challenge here though? <laughs> Why is it so much more difficult to, so notwithstanding kind of increases in the complexity of the model, why is it so much more difficult to do ABC for this data set than it was to do ABC in the, the previous context that I showed you? Um, it's really the fact that we've got very large numbers of replicates. So for some knockdowns, we've got like 100 different kind of experiments, right? So 100 different data sets, but they're hugely variable in, in terms of the initial wound size. So this is just a snapshot from two different, I think, wild type experiments. And you can see that you know, they're just nowhere being close to being the same, which means that to making comparisons kind of between model and data, for each uh, individual experimental replica, we need to initialize a simulation and run that simulation to be all, in order to be able to make comparisons between models and data. So in every kind of um, iteration of your ABC algorithm, you know, you select a parameter value, you know, set, set, select a set of parameters from the prior distribution, and then you basically initialize 100 model simulations um, and use them to compare models and data. And that's just, it's, it's basically just not possible to do that and generate sensible posteriors in a reasonable time frame. So we had to work a bit harder to make this inference process uh, possible for this data set. So, um, so this was all work, and I'll, I'll say again at the end, by my student, uh, Simon Martina Perez. And what Simon did is came up with the concept of mini-batch ABC. And it's incredibly simple, and you can kind of do mini-batch with whatever flavour of ABC you want to. But the idea is that essentially within ABC, we're going to a very large number of times sam sample a parameter from the prior distribution. So you're going to sample a pr parameter from that prior and then what you do is you also sample a mini batch of the data and you do that with replacement. So out of the 100 or 200 kind of experimental replicates you've got, instead of simulating all, you might just pick 10, 
And so what you do is you simulate the model using this parameter value and you do it once kind of for each sample from this mini batch. So again, instead of having to simulate, you know, the model 100 times, you might just simulate it 10 times. And then you evaluate how close the model output is to the data using the same summary statistics and distance function as before. Um, you do it for each sample from the mini batch individually, and then you combine those distances to assign the weights of the parameter. And so I guess the key thing is here that if you sample uh, a mini batch uniformly, uh, a random with replacement at every iteration of kind of this, this ABC loop, um, the ABC algorithm will still see every data set or every experimental replica, right, <laughs> at some point. So the posterior distribution you're going to get is exactly the ABC posterior that you'd expect from kind of regular a vanilla ABC, but the computational cost is um, sort of scaled by the size of your data set to the size of the mini batch. So that can be quite significant. Okay. So we're going to use this or attempt to use this mini, a, uh, mini batch ABC algorithm to make progress in estimating the posterior distribution. Um, the first thing to say is I'm going to clap things, collapse things down a bit. So I'm going to look at the motility parameter. I'm going to look at net proliferation. So that's proliferation minus death rates. I'm going to look at the parameter gamma M, which relates to contact mediation of cell motility, and the parameter gamma P, which is contact mediation of proliferation, and then this motility bias term, which was gamma B. So there's two things I sort of care about here. Number one, I care about being able to select a batch size that will give me uh, sensible posterior distributions that look like the posterior distributions I would get from using the full data set at every iteration. And I also care about being able to, or whether I can identify all the parameters in my model from the data. So maybe I'll do those in inverse order. Um, can I estimate sensibly the parameters uh, of the model from the data? So this is just the wild type data set that I've used here. I would argue that you can get reasonably good estimates or posterior distributions for the motility, for that net proliferation uh, parameter, and also for the parameter gamma M, which represents contact mediation of motility. We learn quite a lot less or not very much probably about gamma P and about gamma M, these uh, sort of proliferation and motility parameters. Um, I think that's a, a facet of the data. It's something that also was observed by Alex Browning in his work, but we're gonna make progress anyway and really focus on these three parameters, which we believe we can relatively confidently identify from the data. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing, does batch size make a difference? Um, we did a lot more tests than just what I'm showing you here, but the take home message is that for the kinds of data that we were looking at, a batch size of 10, uh, between going from a batch size of 10 to a batch size of 50 kind of makes no, almost no difference in terms of the, um, the, the posterior distribution you get. So if we've got, you know, 100 replicates, uh, experimental replicates and use a batch size 10, then our mini batch ABC algorithm will give us kind of just as good results, but with a computational saving of a factor of 10. Okay, so take home message, you can use this mini batch ABC and the data to get reasonable estimates of at least sort of three of these parameters. So let's uh, now apply it to some real data to see if we can uh make any inferences about the biology or even just to see whether what we're going to uh say or attempt to say about the biology from this modeling exercise and anyth anything like lines up with what we might uh already know so what would i say so i think maybe here just to simplify the story a bit so i'm showing you results from inferring the posterior distributions from the mock so from the wild type data set from the cdh5 knockdown data set and from a CDC 42 knockdown data set. So what can you see that, and I think this is probably the posterior that's most impacted by these gene knockdowns. So if we look in the, um, the, the wild type data set, then we see that essentially motility is strongly upregulated in regions of high density. So if gamma M is negative, that's saying that basically uh, a cell attempts to move more in regions of high density. So that's certainly true. That's, that, that's certainly what's happening in wild type, but then um, that's much more the case than it is for CDH5 and CDC42, both of whom, the, for, for both of whom the motility seems much less impacted by variations or increased 
uh, sort of cell density. Um, and the nice thing is that that's consistent with current understanding of the roles of CDC42. So I think CDC42 expression or loss of it is it associated with defective adhesion, uh, with wound healing, defective polarity establishment, um, and migration more generally, which it probably uh, uh, kind of links to this posterior for the motility over here. And CDH5 is known to play an important kind of role in the cohesion and organization of intercellular junctions. So again, consistent with the fact that we're sort of playing around with um, cell cell adhesion is, is leading to these changes or, or is a, a kind of what, what gives rise to these changes in the contact mediation parameter gamma M. So short story, it seems like at least a lot of the results we're getting from identifying these posterior parameter distributions are consistent with some of what we already know experimentally. So then we thought, okay, can we just, uh, you know, um, put everything on the cluster and apply this approach to lots of the rest of the genes in this SI RNA, uh, sorry, the RNAi screen. So we looked at about 100 odd genes. And I don't want you to particularly <laughs> try and take in all the, all the details of this figure. Really what I want to illustrate is the way in which we sort of then tried to analyze uh, the results was to look at the mean of each of the posterior, uh, the mean of the marginal posteriors for each of the parameter values and plot those all on the same axes. It's a very busy figure. Again, don't attempt to understand it all. The point is that then that was quite hard to distill. So what we did was we used k-means clustering as a means to establish essentially whether there were clusters in this, what I would now call phenotype space. So we're making lots of different uh, genetic perturbations and trying to cluster those different perturbations in terms of their, uh, their phenotype, so their functional impact. It all becomes a lot easier to see, I think, when you look at things in this uh, reduced <laughs> dimensional parameter space. So each one of these dots is the posterior mean um, for one genetic knockdown. And what the k-means cluster ring did was identify three separate clusters. So there's one in here in kind of turquoise, there's one in purple, and there's one in green. So cluster three in green, I would say, was uh, sort of genes that gave rise to upregulation of cell motility and also quite high proliferation. Um, and in contrast, probably cluster two, which is in turquoise, are genes for which the contact mediation of motility parameter is positive. So in other words, cells attempt to move less or move less in regions of high cell density, probably then relating to defects in cell cell adhesion. So again, to try and sort of understand a bit better what was going on in this in this plot which still is really really busy and can be a bit hard to interpret what we did was we looked at three of the kind of outliers in the group and tried to then go back into thinking about you know <laughs> use google to first of all see what people know about these genes and what we might expect them to do but also going back into the data sets and sort of compare the extent of wound healing so a couple of things to say. So what I want to say, I wanted to say that if we look at, this is uh, one of the replicates for USP18 and below or in the middle for FA7. And what you can see is that over a period of 24 hours where in wild type, you'd more or less see the, the wound closing, uh, wound healing is significantly delayed or retarded in both of those contexts. So if I just eyeball those kind of images alone and I don't use a mechanistic model, I would have no real understanding as to what it was that was kind of uh, delaying that wound healing process. Whereas if we go into this plot, we can see that in the context of USP18, what's going on is that we're seeing this contact, a very high value of this contact mediation of motility parameters. So cells are moving much less in regions of high cell density. Whereas for the FA7 um, knockdown, uh, I think the kind of lack of wound healing is all to do with the fact that we've got uh, sort of um, net cell death. So this net proliferation parameter is essentially very low or negative. Um, and that's in contrast to the ITPR1, which shows really good wound healing, mostly I think as a result of the fact that the cells are moving a lot and on average proliferating quite a lot. What do we know about what these genes do? So, um, well, ITPR1 is known to regulate apoptosis. So Basically, that is probably consistent. If you if you kind of kind of downregulating apoptosis, then the net proliferation parameter will be high. 
but our model also suggests that it's interfering with uh, cell motility. And we know that, um, well, we might, is that, we might maybe postulate, sorry, that for USP18, um, the effect of knocking down that gene is to essentially um, affect sort of cell adhesion turnover. And so we're really seeing kind of adhesion, uh, adhesions not being regulated in the right kind of way. So some of what we're seeing from all the predictions that we're seeing from our model are definitely, you know, consistent with what we've observed or we know experimentally, but our model also allows us to make some, some new predictions. One more side um, of interpretation of this data. Um, we can also compare things like the cell fold change over the course of an experiment uh, with this uh, net proliferation parameter, so P minus D. And if you don't correct for density dependent effects, you don't do a very good job at predicting the data. But if you do, which is the red line, then you predict the data very well. So it tends to tells us that density dependence of cell proliferation is uh, really important. Um, but we also know that proliferation is not the only factor driving wound closure. So I think the data suggests that the dependence of wound closure on cell number or cell fold change is not as strong as it might be if everything was driven by proliferation on its own. So there's lots in there to tease apart and many more of the details are in the paper, which I'm not going to go over today. Um, but just as a summary, uh, what I've shown is it's possible to calibrate much more complicated models to data and then to use them to infer kind of much more detailed mechanisms uh, that drive in wound closure in a range of gene knockdowns. And I would say that I was kind of in a way quite staggered that we could do as well as we could do because we really don't have access to some time series data. We've got one time point. Um, so we might have quite a lot of replicates in some in, in some cases for, for some gene knockdowns, but we really don't have well-resolved data in time. Um, but nonetheless, we could show that the very complicated relationships between motility and uh, proliferation trade off to drive uh, wound closure. We can't, it's true, confidently identify all the model parameters. And I think, or well, but I think that we could likely get improved results with increased or better resolved uh, data in time. So we've got access to a different data set and we're essentially kind of trying to tease that apart or so whether that's true, understand whether that's true at the moment. As a kind of whole summary, I would say that I think ABC is a really great tool for calibrating models to data, not least because um, it only relies on forward simulation and it's, it's very, sort of simple to understand and intuit, at least in its very sort of simple form. So it's sort of great in a collaborative uh, environment where not everyone's familiar with kind of <laughs> very complicated statistical techniques. Um, I think the downside of the very sort of naive forms of ABC are that they are sort of computationally prohibitive. And I've called them kind of for modern mathematical biology studies. So when we're dealing with sort of cell-based or individual-based models that are stochastic, that have got many different parameters, I think the, the kind of naive forms can be, um, just don't work from the perspective of computational efficiency. We thought a lot about how to, to get over that challenge uh, from a different range of different perspectives, but mini batch ABC, I think is one way uh, to apply ABC approaches to high throughput data sets without incurring huge computational costs. And I didn't really talk about it at all, but um, you can use a mini batch approach with ABC rejection or ABC SMC or essentially whatever your kind of favorite flavor of ABC is. So I think there's potential to combine it with um, other time saving uh, sort of methods. And then just to finish up, so all the mini batch ABC stuff was done by Simon Martina Press, who's a brilliant PhD student in my group in collaboration with Eva Salem in engineering. And then all the people on the right hand side contributed to the early parts of this work. So in particular, a lot of the early inference work was done by Andrew Parker when he was a PhD student in my group in collaboration with Matt Simpson at QUT. So with that, I'm gonna stop because uh, time's marching on and say thanks uh, for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions or hear any thoughts you might have. Excellent, thanks yeah, Owen. for great talk, Ruth. And yeah, I'll open to uh, questions. I think uh, Owen had his hand up first. So. Right, yeah, well, uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Ruth. That's um, 
really interesting. Um, perhaps more of a, a comment than a question. So I've, um, I've actually done something similar to your mini batch um, uh, a few years ago, um, also with um, population data, um, mm. uh, looking at populations of parasites. Um, and um, uh, what I did was um, instead of sampling randomly, actually sort of cycled through the uh, the different um, uh, experimental data sets we had. But the, um, uh, the, the, the big advantage I found was that um, the data we had um, uh, could be very different. So the populations could explode, they could crash, um, or, you know, or the host could die. And so what you found was that um, trying to get um, a simulation that matched any one particular instance was all the, was hard enough. So then, when you mm. tried to get a whole set of uh, simulations to match a similar set of, of, of data, uh, it was almost impossible. So, so by breaking it down, you actually got um, the acceptance rate became you know sort of feasible. So, so, yeah. so that was so that was my sort of take on uh, sort of why it worked, I suppose, in terms of speeding things up. So, so the um... yeah no I think God I was gonna say I think you're totally right and I think it's just capturing you know how you I think there's a there's a real question about how you capture the variability in stochastic models and what summary statistics to use in the context where the model out can be model out can be very variable and you know it's not clear to me that matching the mean or the variance is is sensible right that might just not be uh, mm -hmm. relevant so yeah I think it's a, a really important point and. Definitely something we've thought about and struggled with in, in this context and in other contexts as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anyway, so yes, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, Tim's got a question now. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, if nobody else has anything to say, because I know Thomas mentioned um, our DDM stuff. Um, would you mind going back to the slide on uh, your data that you have um, that you're saying the cell tracking is particularly challenging for? Uh, I mean, we didn't say spend, I have to say, like, a huge amount of time doing this at all. But it's just I think that in this context, the fibroblasts are quite complicated. You know, the shape's quite complicated and the images are about every five minutes. So sometimes it just was quite tricky to resolve without looking at you know like sort of you know by except by human eye uh which cell was which and even then i i think probably there's a degree of error i think it's partly the uh the contrast of the images and partly because we don't have something like a nuclear stain but i'm sure there are lots more you know since we did this which was probably uh i don't know eight or so years ago then there's maybe much better tools for doing this. But if you've got thoughts or suggestions on how to analyze these data sets, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, DDM might be an option. So essentially the way that DDM works is you take pairs of images from your time series images and you subtract them from each other to get differences and you Fourier transform them. And that essentially allows you to, even if you do have a very dense set of particles, because the signals from a particle to itself over time is gonna be stronger than the, part, the signal, sorry, that you get from a particle to all the other ones over time essentially that signal dominates as you continue to stack your images up and DDM okay. allows you to just extract the dominant behaviors. So even if you can't determine, oh, that particular particle went to that place, as long as you have enough data. So it does rely on you having a lot of data um, to do lots of good statistical sampling, but it could be an option. Um, do you have data that you'd be able to make accessible? Because I'm always just looking for data that I can run this on and see where yeah, we can get so it to we work. Have got, we have got I have got access to some of this data, but we've got other data. That can, I, can I jump in on this? One thing you've mentioned is you hand track this. So that's sort of the gold standard. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's one thing we've got at the moment, Tim, where is it, can we compare DDM with a gold standard of hand track? So if, if you, yeah. I don't know that you mentioned this new data, has that also been tracked by hand? Uh, so when I say we hand track this, we only hand tracked five cells. So <laughs> I'm right. not, not sure there's much gold standard in there. Um, so the new data we've got now has a main track by hand, but um, I think it's actually, I'll take a look in just a second, I think it's actually all freely available. So we've been doing quite a lot of work um, 
with a group in Princeton who are interested in various aspects of sort of collective motility. And they've got a paper that just came out in PLOS Computational Biology that looks at inferring um, inferring cell motility kind of rules, if you like, or the behaviors uh, using essentially uh, machine learning approaches right applied to kind of large data sets so that might just be a really good data set to look at that's way better than this one so i think it's probably much better result in time but let me see if i can dig it out for you and dig the paper out and then um yeah that paper that. would be absolutely ideal because that's exactly what ddm is kind of missing at the moment is you can run it on anything i've, I've run it on youtube clips before of famous songs just to show that you can do it but it doesn't necessarily correlate with the motion that's actually happening so that's one of the big questions we've been asking is how can you pull out the motion that you're seeing and you know understand what's going on so that paper would be perfect okay. if you could find that i can either email yeah. you if you know that to thomas possibly it'd be really yeah, appreciated. Well, well, yeah one of those would work i can probably put my hands on it back quickly yeah so i just sort of added that point one of the nice things about abc is if you've got something like this you can always just throw it into the mix. I mean, you can, you can calculate your DDM for the data for your model and add it as a summary statistic. Um, and yep. you know, it doesn't, doesn't need to actually solve the problem as long as it's adding some information. Uh, yeah, 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 certainly. Yeah, that's a, a good plan, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we didn't, you know, in the very end of this project, with this kind of data, we didn't spend very much time thinking about what the summary statistics should be. We kind of, you know, went down the route of using a few that have been established, but you're right, I think there are probably some statistics that could could really help and to do a better job. Um, in this context, I think the main challenge is probably that we just don't have any time series data, right? We've got one, we've got 24 hours and, and nothing else. But so I think with kind of better resolved in time data, we could do a lot more. But it would be interesting to see if the kinds of statistics that came out of the your approach would work certainly because we've got other data sets where we're sort of looking at applying similar kinds of methods um i was going to say something else but i've lost the plot totally um but yeah no excellent point thank you <laughs> i do have a question to ask you touched on it just a little bit there um I, i've noticed some of your more recent work Ruth, has been looking at this question so i think this is the holy grail of rather than approaching a system and talking to the biologist and saying, you know, okay, well, what do you think? Here's the model that matches what you think. Can you extract that model from the data? And that, mm. that's, that's sort of, that'd be really, really cool. That, you know, can you infer mechanisms based on data rather than fitting the mechanism to the data? Um, and I was just wondering is, how are these uh, Bayesian techniques going towards that? Are they going towards that? It's a really good point. Um, I've got like two different answers, I think. So number one, yeah, so we have played around with this quite a bit, this idea of learning, trying to learn models directly from data. And we've tried to do that in a Bayesian context. And I can send you a reference if that's useful. Um, I think that's one thing that's really clear from that work is that you need, you know, at least for the stuff we've worked on, quite highly resolved time series data. Um, and that you... <laughs> It gets, sort of sounds trivial when you say it, but you can't pick up pick up terms in the model if the behavior is not there in the data, right? So, so in one context, when we tried to do this, we know there were density dependent effects, but we know the data that we chose to use just didn't show that, right? The the time series kind of wasn't, or the initial condition wasn't right. So I think there's huge amounts to be. I think, I think we can kind of make progress by, by trying to learn models from data, but I'd like to not think that we don't use our expertise as well as part of that process. And I think there's a danger in, in terms of not doing that. So, you know, in the context of learning models from data, what are the physical constraints at the, you know, or conservation laws in those kinds of systems? How do we encode them? Um, and something else I was gonna say, which was, I'm gonna blame it on COVID now. Um, <laughs> how do statistical approaches help? So one of the things I think we've been thinking about a bit or quite a bit recently is kind of how to use sort of these Bayesian statistics approaches to think about a level of model that's appropriate for the data. And we've always talked about this, I think, as applied mathematicians of being a real art and it is a real art, right? To construct a model 
at the level at which it's still going to provide us with new insights, but it's sort of not too complicated, right, that we can't, you know, explore it properly. But I think that some of the Bayesian techniques surrounding kind of parameter identifiability um, can, can give us some real clues about what level of model is appropriate for the data. So how complicated can a model be? And, you know, um, but we can still have the ability with that model to, you know, provide you insight, but in the same time kind of pin down the parameters, right? So I think I would sort of always, I don't know, I like to err on the side of simple when it comes to modeling most of the, most of the time. And I think that's partly because then I know that we can, or hope that we can confidently estimate model parameters. Because I think if you can't do that, then when you transfer your model to unseen scenarios, you, you've always got to worry about kind of what the implications of, uh, of not being able to pin down parameters is. So, uh, I think that in short, maybe there's a lot that I think we can learn from using some of these Bayesian statistics approaches and machine learning approaches to try and learn models. But at the same time, we sort of shouldn't forget that user expertise and talking to people about their hypotheses and their observations is also really important. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I, I don't want to make you sound like we want to remove the biologists entirely, but, you know, where they always have our, their place to work with us. Uh, but no, I do have to run away now. Th uh, thank you, Ruth. Oh. Um, Pleasure to see you. Later. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... yeah, excellent. Well, that's three o'clock. So, yeah, thanks again, Ruth, for a really great talk. And yeah, if anyone wants to stick around in this uh, call, you're more than welcome to. Otherwise, um, Sounds like people have got plans to communicate um, with Ruth uh, via email, et cetera. So yeah, excellent. And, uh, I'll, there'll be some sweet treats. I'm afraid I can't send them over to Oxford, but um, I will be in the uh, third floor common room now for a bit if anyone wants to discuss uh, general stuff and yeah, have some cookies. But yeah, we'll see you next week for uh, the next seminar, which I think is in person this time. So excellent. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone, and thanks for the questions. Right. And um, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.